Thank you, Lon. <coughs> appreciate that introduction. And similar to my colleagues who are presenting before me, I am very grateful for the help and support of Anne, Nick, uh, Rosalie, Christina, and Daisy, as well as uh, Bill Mornish and the New School for hosting this exhibition and lecture series. And I'd also like to add that it's been a, a real pleasure um, getting to know the other five winners during this past week. Um, having the opportunity to learn more about their work has been uh, humbling, to say the very least. Uh, I've selected three design projects to show you and talk about tonight. Um, a house, a pair of houses, and an installation. I've chosen these specifically to share because I think that taken together, they're suggestive of a range of ways that the discipline recently has been acting uh, differently. Now the status of difference, of course, relies on some pre-existing baseline, uh, a datum from which dissimilarity can be registered or some divergence can occur. For me, and I suspect for many of my generation who were also educated during the early part of the previous decade, the baseline was largely defined by an intense intrigue surrounding the prospects of digital or computational methods in architecture. At that time, things like parametric and relational modeling felt new. There were still novelties associated with some CNC fabrication techniques. We were still impressed by the ability to manage and visualize large amounts of data. We were still taken by new forms of representation like renderings and animations. And though it's difficult and likely dangerous to make generalizations about the status of the discipline, I wonder if some of the more interesting and engaging work being made by members of this generation is capable of being classified as post-digital. Now, the prefix post in this case isn't aimed at being contrarian to the digital project, but rather more simply intends to signify that which happens after or that which happens in response to, or even that which reaps the benefits of. If until recently it felt as though the digital was the disciplinary project, in the sense that design problems were our opportunities to flex our technologically sophisticated muscles, now it seems that our facility of competition is perhaps a more subdued enabler of other kinds of cultural projects. Said differently, after we witnessed the exhaustion of the phase of the digital project, which was inadvertently monopolized by aesthetic concerns, it would seem now that a number of us are more, more motivated by a deeper and thorough incorporation of computation into our practice. As digital methods have become inextricably ingrained in the design process, I'd argue that they have become resituated as fundamental rather than novel. This transition is beginning to enable us to direct our attention elsewhere, allowing for the emergence of new and even the possibility of the re-emergence of old architectural agendas likely to produce more nuanced work. Allendale House is an example of a project that is simple and primitive formally speaking, but benefited from being conceived parametrically as a way to manage and calibrate a series of interdependent geometric variables. It's a small A-frame house, about 1,800 square feet, designed for the mountain west region of the U.S., more specifically a steep and densely wooded site in Colorado. The house, of being a vacation house, makes associations with, say, summer camps in its use of the A-frame typology. The idea was to appropriate a housing type that once represented a kind of utility, a modesty, and an impermanence that was well suited for vacation living, then recast some of its underutilized architectural potentials so as to provide a place that would want to be visited year-round. For example, uh, the house tries to undermine some of the limitations of a triangular section by reveling in the spatial potentials of the extreme vertical proportion. 
the house is comprised of three volumes of different widths uh, that each contain distinct programs. Three pieces are all horizontal extrusions of asymmetrical A-frames. The skinniest of the three A-frames is on the western side, and it sits atop uh, in an embedded volume. These spaces contain a wine cellar, uh, a single car garage, and a library. The library has access to a very long, attenuated deck which partially covers the driveway and makes a, a kind of perch um, to look out over and into the thickness of the birch trees. The wide A-frame is in the center of the house, and it's really the only portion of the house that is um, wide enough to adequately contain two, uh, two floors within the A-frame. And the programs in this part of the house are a little more private, so the bathrooms, the, the office, the, uh, the bedrooms, those are all located here. Now, the position of this compartmentalized program also provides um, as much separation as is possible in such a small, linearly organized house between the main collective space uh, on one end of the house in the library on the other end of the house. Third, the medium A-frame is on the eastern side of the house and consists of the living, kitchen, and the dining areas. Now, the house derives its name and, and was in part inspired by a 2006 painting uh, by Tala Auerbach called um, And Ale Hall, which uh, starkly aligns three variations of a triangular A-shaped figure. So I was interested in the possibility that each of the profiles uh, in the house would have distinct programmatic responsibilities and separate volumetric identities, but when stitched together, could produce an overall sequence of spatial continuity. Uh, in order to bring these A-frames together, uh, a, a wide range of configurations were tested. There are four interrelated variables that make up this parametric model. Um, the first variable is the one that has to do with the relative orientation of the adjacent two segments. Changing these results in very different relationships to the site and establishes different view corridors uh, from the interior of the house out to the site. The second variable um, is the severity of rotation between each of the segments. This affects the degree of spatial separation or continuity between each of the two segments. The third is the sequence of the three bay widths, where each of the programs would be relative to one another. And the last variable is the location of the apex of the triangle relative to its base. And it's this kind of variability that enables the house uh, to be geometrically continuous, which relies on the ability for a given A-frame profile to shift to allow uh, alignment with its neighbor. And it's this last variable, the one that concerns the degree which the A-frames mean, that enables the house to be read monolithically. There are also, of course, implications of the interior of the house. The biasing of the A-frame to one side produces acutely aligned uh, angled corners. And these conditions that could have posed problematic head height limitations are resolved by allowing the interior surface of the ceiling to deviate from the roof surface as it nears the floor to become plumb. Now the thickness is the, that is created then um, between the inner wall surface and the outer roof surface is reclaimed as volume from which to cause creating deep apertures, bookshelves, and showcases. What I haven't mentioned yet is that the Allen Mill House was designed to display a fairly eccentric collection of artifacts uh, similar in nature to the collections in John Stone's house and any cabinet curiosities. But different than those precedents, perceptually the ambition is to tuck these pieces on display within the implied surface of the interior liner, enabling the artifacts and books to be seen while simultaneously providing the possible conception of the space as a, as a simple volume. Twins uh, is a design project for two homes 
for two brothers and their families on a large plot of land in upstate New York. The project investigates the, an interesting part of the relationship known as the mathematical principle of dissection. As a way of dealing with the self-similarities and differences in the organizations of the houses. Specifically, the principle of dissection says that any two regular polygons with equal areas, such as, in this case, a 2600 square foot hexagon and square, can be divided into sets of similar shapes. In other words, this regular six-sided polygon and this regular four-sided polygon contain the same four trapezoids <coughs> and one triangle. The project makes use of this principle as an unusual solution to the similarities and programmatic requirements for the two houses, and also to generate distinctions in the ways that the spaces within the houses relate to one another. To use a metaphor, the idea is that the houses share the same DNA, but represent clearly distinct and uniquely idiosyncratic manifestations of that DNA. But more architecturally, the use of this principle as a governor of design possibility was taken on really as a challenge to find alternative formats of flexibility uh, within such fixed arrangements and plan. So as one can imagine, the static quality of the plan prompts the manipulation of building sections. Flows in the circulation of the residents within the houses are encouraged by the orientation of the various facets of the floorscapes. And likewise, flows in the circulation of rain and meltwater are directed by the orientation of the surfaces to find the roofscapes. Programmatically, all of the pairs of parts are used similarly between the two houses, uh, although each piece opportunistically utilizes its unique location and adjacencies. For example, this triangular space uh, is used as a vertically oriented open air courtyard in the center of the square house and as a landscape oriented screened in porch in the hexagon house. Every design moment that exists in one house has a self-similar corridor in the other house. Here, in sequence, are two interior perspectives showing similar programmatic and sectional conditions playing out differently. One in the square house here, and its twin, so to speak, in the hexagon house. The distance between the houses is partially governed by the desire to balance privacy and access, yet is really calibrated with the development of the agricultural usage of the interstitial land. The specific siding and orientation of each of the houses privileges a visual linkage between each of the main spaces, which could be maintained during about half of the year. During the other half of the year, the growth of the shared crops would obstruct the visual connection. The water collection from the two roofs is directed to a subterranean piping system between the houses, so the agricultural development of the land between the two houses separates them spatially on the one hand, while linking them inextricably both infrastructurally and one can say communally on the other hand. Water distribution stems from two pairs of water channels embedded in two walls in each of the houses. And the planometric dovetailing of the four crops, which oscillate in harvest seasons, accommodates different proximities of crops in each of the houses. So leaf vegetables, berries, grains, and corn are braided together in order to provide each house immediate access to each food type. A secondary ambition which directs the possible formal outcomes of the houses, aside from the two kinds of circulation that motivate the roof and floor scapes, is an overall articulation of the five volumes as discrete parts. So in addition to the performative aspects of the orientation of the surfaces of each of the two scapes, there's also a formal objective of allowing each of the pieces to become as seemingly independent as possible. This was played out primarily in elevation, the goal being to maximize the number of misalignments between volumes. Following that logic, the location of the large aperture apertures tries to accentuate each one of those shifts in elevation. From the exterior, both formally and material, the houses remain abstract to offer a reading of the forms almost as coincidental packings 
of discrete volumes with orientational differences. There is a rubber roofing system that is used for the tops of the houses and a dark, thick stucco that coats the sides and the underbelly of the houses. The a third and last project that I'll show is a proposal for the 2010 PS1 Moment Young Architects Program called Weather's Permitting. Um, seeing as you're all New Yorkers, you all likely know the yearly competition mandate which calls for the design of a temporary summer pavilion that provides the city of the beach uh, with all the related social and environmental components. So it should act as a place of respite six days a week and a place to socialize and listen to music once a week on every Saturday. This duality of constituents, the museum goer and the party goer, was really interesting to us. On the one hand, we imagine the design of the pavilion as an opportunity to produce a relatively serene environment equipped with vaguely natural elements like shorelines, ponds, puddles, and canopies. And then as, on the other hand, uh, a kind of recasting of a Coney Island boardwalk. The challenge then was to conflate both into a single landscape. The installation, I should say the would-be installation, uh, a manipulated boardwalk is conceived as a flexible construct. Its malleability makes use of the common directionality inherent um, in parallel planks of wood in order to guide the locations of the folds and the surface. The idea is that the transitions between two-dimensional surface and three-dimensional volume would offer multiple littoral zones, which would mimic the variety of aquatic conditions typically associated with coastlines. We developed a taxonomy of pleats in a landscape that simultaneously produced troughs, containment of water, and vertical elements like visors to give shade. The scale remains of the police could accommodate larger groups of people, but also could enable a visitor a surprising amount of privacy. We uh, gave names for the different zones according to their similar characteristics to conditions found in nature. For example, terms like the clearing, described the largest open space with very few canopies could be collectively occupied. And the thicket described the zone that was most densely populated with small canopies and pools and was designed more for individual use. Terrain was designed as a composite so that as an elevated boardwalk it could take on the unconventional and uncanny ability to retain water. Uh, a rubber membrane would be layered under the portions of the landscape that were to collect water. Structurally speaking, the system would act similarly to a fully plant system, gaining rigidity at the corner where the peak value relationship gets inverted when transitioning from a horizontal peak to a vertical peak. Six days of the week, the pavilion would register the indeterminate patterns of weather, allowing the depressions in the terrain to collect and evaporate water intermittently which would highlight the oscillation of environmental conditions. To underscore this idea, we took uh, what we call the core sample through various layers of both constructed and natural environments as a way of imagining the potential interrelationships. <coughs> the other day of the week for the Saturday events, the system of pools would be capable of being drained and then filled annually. In terms of construction, the surface area of the deck requires wood from four mature white ash trees. We learned that green rough cut lumber is extremely flexible and enables a tremendous amount of bending without the additional time intensity and costly steps of steaming, jig construction, and kiln drying. The location of the planks within the cross cut of the log equates to different grain orientation. Um, and this affects the types and degrees of flexibility of the length of the planks. The thinking was that by identifying these traits, the natural behaviors of the wood grain, we could then strategically assign the different bend types, whether it be a bow, a crook, a torque, or a cup, to the portions of completed topography that would benefit most from that particular behavior, easing the kinds of transitions that the planks would need to undergo. The hope was to produce a varied and differentiated environment that encouraged a kind of exploration 
similar to the way that one might explore a natural landscape. We developed a field guide and a field map and a set of exhibit cards to help explorers navigate that unfamiliar terrain. By way of conclusion, I'd like to end the talk with a short 